Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning. Things are getting better. This is the first time that um, I've, every time I've been here, the front two rows have been empty. I was almost thinking of getting the chairs taken away. However, we're halfway there, so well done. I'm looking forward. I'm here again next Sunday. I wonder if somebody, <laughs> somebody might like to really risk it and <laughs> sit in the front row. We'll see. Anyway, there are no <coughs> other intimations this morning. But the theme of the service today <coughs> is increasing our faith. Gospel lesson today taken from St. Luke, um, a shortish but quite a difficult passage. So I'd ask you just to watch it quite carefully when it comes up on the screen. Um, <coughs> increasing our faith. That if we have faith in Jesus, then of course we'll follow him, uh, we'll obey him, we'll dutifully perform work for Jesus. In other words, faith, it's not just <clears throat> an intellectual achievement by believers, but it's also very much obedient practice by Jesus' disciples and Jesus' followers. So that's the theme of the service this morning. We begin by worshipping God and singing together hymn 498 in the hymn book, which is Angel Voices Ever Singing. Now let's pray together. Let us pray. Lord, we know that your heart rejoices in each work divine, and that you did indeed design ears and hands and voices for your praise and your glory. And together with craftsman's art and music's measure, 
They all do combine for your pleasure as our offering of worship and of praise. Lord, every time we come into your presence, we're amazed by your grace and your understanding. We're overwhelmed by your care and by your concern for us. We're moved by the joy which you have in us. And so we long to worship you in a way that is worthy of you, Lord. And we praise you for Jesus Christ, that he, who was divine from the beginning, emptied himself of the glory that was his by right. So we praise you. We praise you that he added to his divine nature all that it means to be a human being. Lord, we are not worthy. We're not worthy of the faith that you've placed in us. Our worship is unworthy, our service falls short, and our sense of commitment to your cause and kingdom could be so much warmer and so much more enthusiastic. So please hear us as we admit these faults and these failings, as we admit to the ways that we've fallen down on our commitment to you personally as we admit all the wrongs that we have committed. So, Lord, in a moment of quietness, just hear our personal confession to you now. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come unto you. So may the almighty and merciful Lord grant to us pardon and remission of all our sins, time for the amendment of our lives, and the grace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Father, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of life. You've given us responsibility not just for our own lives, but also for the well-being of our neighbors and others. And so we ask you to fill us, Lord, with the love and the power of your Spirit, that we may complete the tasks that you've laid upon us. And in Jesus' name now we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. See, we've got a a full turnout of young people this morning. Very nice to see you all. Well done. Any of you been watching anything particular on the television this past week or so? (laughs) Nobody has. Well, let me just give you a reminder. Could you just put up the slide, please? This might just prompt you if anything's coming. There we are. <clears throat> right, have you seen these before? And what is it? It's the sign of what? Good, well done. Yes, how many colors are there? Many colors do you see there? Yep. I see more than five. Very good. Which is the sixth one? White, right. Good. You would all have said that, of course. Yes, that's right. Six. Okay. And (coughs) talking to the adults as well, do you know why there are these five colors there? Hmm? Five continents. Five continents. Uh Uh-huh. Anything else? 
Well, this, uh, that motif <coughs> um, was given to the Games in 1912. So now, that's over 100 years ago. And <coughs> between them, these colours represented the colours of the flags of all the participating countries. Now, there are now um, three countries which have added extra colours. And the three colours are Bhutan, Bhutan and Armenia and Sri Lanka. Does anybody know? No, you'd really have to know this. Um, what extra colours would have been added if that had been made now? Brown and orange. No. Not that I know of. <laughs> I shouldn't really say no. Um, well, orange is one of them, actually, and another one is purple. That if, you, that if this was being made now, it would have to include these two. Um, <clears throat> and as you say, they're linked together because it's showing the five continents, if you like, coming together um, as one around the world. And there's a, an Olympic motto. Anybody know what the motto is? No, neither did I. <laughs> it's in Latin, actually. Citius Altius Fortius. Citius Altius Fortius. Does anybody now know what it is? Hmm. Right. Faster, higher, stronger. Faster, higher, stronger. There we are. And, of course, the other great motif with that is the torch. The torch that, as we know, goes, is always lit and goes from one Olympic Games to the other. And that's called the light of spirit and knowledge and life. The light of spirit, knowledge and life. But you all knew that anyway. But passing the flame, of course, um, from one person to another expresses the handing on of that symbol and the symbolic fire from generation to generation. And of course, as we know, it gets lit. Generally just one, but of course, here we are in Paris with this very grand arrangement of a circle of flame. But we give God thanks that we're part of it and we give God thanks that there is something like this to bring the nations together. Now, I'm going to sing another hymn. In our lives, plant seeds of hope. Now, this, um, <clears throat> the words of this are relevant to what the sermon's going to be about this morning. I'm going to ask Elizabeth to play the tune over, um, and then we'll stand and attempt it. It's not difficult, but it's a new tune, I think.
Our first, first reading this morning is from Psalm 137, reading from verses 1 to 6. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy, they said. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Our second reading is from St. Luke, chapter 17, reading at verse 1 to verse 10. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase your faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also... When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Amen. May God bless to us this reading of his holy word, and to his name be the glory and the praise. Just to take you back a moment to that first reading, the one from the Psalms. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept. I don't know who here might be old enough like me to remember a pop song in the late 1970s, sung by a singing group by the name of Boney M., called The Rivers of Babylon. I remember buying it as I was studying for the ministry at the time, and I was furious that the tape package gave the title of the piece by The Rivers of Babylon. And then it said underneath, um, had the cheek to say, words by Boney M. The words were not by Boney M at all. The words were by whoever wrote Psalm 137. I should have written to them and complained, but there was other things to do at the time, and I never did it. However, I can't read that psalm without thinking about it and humming the tune to the song. Here it is. up if you remember that. Good, I thought so. I just wanted to get an idea of the age of the congregation. (laughs) So there we are. Good. Anyway, what has that got to do with the sermon? Nothing. But I thought I'd be interested to see if you knew it. No, the sermon today from that passage from St. Luke 
uh, that Joe was reading, so Luke chapter 17, verse 5, <clears throat> where the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. <clears throat> now, I think just about all of us in the church, we do from time to time, we need to review our faith and our commitment. And that's a pretty good text to hang it on to. So without putting too much on it, the context in which that um, little text is um, placed is really quite difficult. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. But to put it in context, if you were listening to the reading, <clears throat> But for most of the gospel of St. Luke up to that point, the disciples have been witnessing Jesus in action. He's spoken to them in parables. He's sketched out for them the nature of the kingdom of God. But many of the stories he's told are, as we know, either confusing or sometimes they're just plain difficult. Certainly to the disciples who heard them, and quite often to us as well. Jesus, as we know, has miraculously healed some people. He's fed people from virtually nothing, silenced the wind and the waves of a stormy sea. How can things like that happen? And then we come to this chapter and the passage that we were reading, and there's a bit about hanging millstones around the neck, and then there's forgiving seven times. And then the disciples bursting forth with this plea to increase our faith. Almost like as if they've been suppressing that for some time. And then very quickly it goes on after that passage to speak about something completely different. At first glance... A passage like that seems like a string of rather disconnected thoughts from Jesus. It starts with the suggested punishment for causing little ones to stumble, put a millstone around their neck, and then verses 3 and 4 are about <coughs> extravagant forgiveness. And then in verse 5, here it suddenly changes into a matter of faith. Lord, increase our faith. But then when you think about it a bit more, perhaps the two ideas of extravagant forgiveness and then increasing faith are connected. Because whilst forgiveness for wrongs done to us seven times is an almost impossible demand, we realize that the only way that it might be possible is if our faith was increased. Jesus says to the disciples, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do such and such. But if we change that if into because and said, because you have faith the size of a mustard seed, then you can do so much more. That's like saying that we have been given enough faith to be disciples of Jesus. So that's like saying then that we have all the faith that we need right here. I wonder if you've ever <clears throat> listened to and come to the end of a sermon or a scripture reading <clears throat> and wanted to blurt out, Lord, just increase my faith. Well, if you have, <clears throat> or if you felt like it, I hope it's reassuring for you to know that Jesus says, you don't need to have much faith. Faith the size of a tiny mustard seed. That will do. And that's pretty reassuring because most of us were not adept practitioners of the faith. <clears throat> it's saying that God has already given us enough people, enough to do the work that God commands, enough good ideas enough financial and spiritual resources to get the job done. <clears throat> we've got enough time, we've got enough energy, got enough money. 
Nothing that God demands <clears throat> is impossible for us in our present gifted state. Jesus says that as long as you've got faith the size of a mustard seed, just a little bit of it, <clears throat> that's enough to get on and do God's work. <clears throat> now, maybe you're sitting there saying, but that's ridiculous. Of course we don't have enough of it. Don't have enough of what we need in the church. If you look at our church nationally, don't have enough money to do all that we'd like to do, either there throughout Scotland or perhaps even in closer home. Don't have enough volunteers always for the tasks that we want to undertake. Everywhere we turn, there can be a lack or a scarcity. Well, if we do think that, and to be fair, this congregation is shielded from a lot of that, because we do have a lot of volunteers and helpers. <clears throat> but nevertheless, taken nationally, we can be in quite good company because there's a lot of churches that I've known that don't have enough. I remember when I started out in the ministry, I remember an older and wiser minister saying to me something like, as a minister, you're going to learn of all the shortcomings and the wrongdoings of your people. And it'll be quite easy just to get overwhelmed by all of it and be defeated by too pessimistic an assessment of them. Just remember, he said, that people for all their shortcomings and all their problems, <clears throat> they're still God's people. They're still the ones whom God has sent to be the church and to be the church in this place and in this time, we are what the best that God has got. He sent us. <clears throat> so if we apply ourselves, it's saying that we hear in the households of this congregation and parish that we <clears throat> are the best that God has got at this time and in this place. You are all that God needs for God to get done what he wants done here. <clears throat> now, if we go back to the gospel passage, we recall that Jesus had called this small group of disciples to follow him. And throughout the story of the gospels, they've shown that they are less than perfect. <clears throat> they've misunderstood him and they've disobeyed him, and yet Jesus tells them that they are to be full of forgiveness, to forgive those that have wronged them time and again. And I ask you, is there a much more difficult thing to do than to forgive not once but many times, or seven times, as it says here? What on earth, from what Jesus has seen of these disciples in action, <clears throat> what on earth gives Jesus the impression that they will be able to obey him in his demand that they be forgivers? Why set himself up for yet another disappointment? Well, maybe that's why the disciples then beg of Jesus, Jesus, increase our faith. <clears throat> increase our faith. If you're going to ask great things of us, Jesus, then you'll need to make sure that we've got plenty of faith. And then Jesus surprises them with his reply. You don't need much faith to be faithful as one of my disciples. You just need a small amount of faith. A small amount of faith. Small as a tiny mustard seed. That's enough. In other words, they have all that they need to obey Jesus and to be his disciples. They've got more than enough. Increase our faith, say the disciples. You already have enough faith to do what I command you, says Jesus. It is for us, then, is it not, to take what we have been given in terms of faith and then to go out and apply it. <clears throat> Forgive seven times commands Jesus. What would your reply be to that? 
probably to say, look, Jesus, I'm no saint. I try to do what little good I can, but I'm not that religious. And Jesus replies, I have given you all that you need to follow me. Now just get on and do it. If you were listening to the gospel reading as, it, as we went through it, <clears throat> after that utterance of the disciples about, Lord, increase our faith, it goes on in an almost unconnected way. Jesus tells what at first hearing sounds like a totally unrelated parable about a master and servants in which after they've worked in the fields all day are then expected by the master to serve him a meal. And these servants can only say, we are unworthy servants who have only done our duty. So what does that have to say with increasing our faith? And maybe that's the point. What is faith if it's not something in your mind or in your heart? But what is rather something in your hands? What if faith in Jesus isn't so much a matter of having figured Jesus out or getting your head straight about him, rather just getting your whole life straight about him. Maybe Jesus is telling the disciples and thereby telling us that faith is not some exotic intellectual achievement. <clears throat> no, it's just a matter of humbly, daily mundanely attempting to obey Jesus and to follow Jesus and to do our bit for Jesus. In every church congregation, there's times when a key person moves away or leaves and we're left wondering, how on earth are we going to replace the treasurer or the leader of the young people or the organist or whatever? But in just about all of these situations, somebody does come and step up to the mark in due course because there are gifts within many people, but they don't always come to light until there's a crisis or there's some help needed. How many gifts, I wonder, has God given this congregation, given to you and given to me, ones that are yet to be discovered. Increase our faith. Give us more volunteers. Send us some rich people to help balance this year's budget. Fix the heating system. And Jesus looks at us for all our weaknesses and all our faults and says, you have all you need. You've been given enough faith to do what I expect you to do. Martin Luther King <clears throat> once noted that there's only, he said, only a few plots in all the great novels, plots that keep repeating themselves over and over again. <clears throat> and one of the plots, he said, is this, a widely separated family inherits a house in which they're all forced to live together. Now he said, that's us, that's the church. We are fated by God to live within the body of Christ and there's no way for sinful people like us to live together unless it is by obeying Jesus, by forgiving one another, by having faith in all that we do. <clears throat> so perhaps Jesus was telling the disciples and through them is telling us that faith, it's not some exotic intellectual achievement. No, it's just rather a matter of humbly, daily, mundanely attempting to obey Jesus and to follow him, to do your bit for Jesus, whether it's helping a neighbor or doing a job for somebody or a job in the church that needs done or extending a hand of friendship to where it's needed, or, well, you get the point. We don't have to be great practitioners of belief. 
we must be, as Jesus said in the text, dutiful servants. Don't have to have a huge ability or an intellectual ability to believe. We simply must be those who know that Jesus has given all of us a job to do. And then throughout life, we get on and we do it. And so for most of us, surely that is good news indeed. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Amen. And thanks be to God for this preaching of his word. And to him be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 549 in the hymn book. How deep the Father's love for us. Now a prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that though you are a high and holy God, that you're not remote or unmoved or unfeeling, but that you live in the hearts of your people. We praise you that through the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, that you have made it possible for us not only to know you, but also to hear your call to commitment and to service. Father, we worship you 
We worship you for the riches with which you shower our lives and the riches of your grace with which you wish to fill our hearts. We thank you that in the empty cross and in the empty tomb and in the emptying out of the Holy Spirit that you have given us the assurance of your love, assurance of your love for us and our place in your kingdom. <clears throat> and that by grace you call us and by your spirit you empower us. You empower us to live for Christ and to declare his name. We thank you. We thank you for the world in which we live. And we ask that you will hear our prayers now for all who live within it. <clears throat> we give thanks for the Olympic Games, which are in progress just now in Paris. This is such a great opportunity afforded every once in four years to bring the nations of the world together. And we pray that through healthy competition, that this may be so. Bless all who strive to give of their best, <clears throat> whether as participant or organizer or spectator, so that the torch representing spirit and knowledge and life may burn brightly and may burn not just in Paris, but symbolically in the hearts of all God's people. <clears throat> we pray for our own nation. God bless our King and the members of his family. Bless all who serve in government, <clears throat> in national institutions, in councils, or in other ways, that our country may be well served and progress through competent work and a spirit of goodwill. We pray especially today for the people of Southport and for the families of the girls who have lost their lives through violence and those who are in hospital still <coughs> recovering from knife crime. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, about the violence which is being shown in many English cities just now. Pray, Lord, for peace and for understanding. And we pray for our police force <clears throat> and for all who serve in the emergency services and for our health service. And we pray too for our own situations, for our families and our loved ones, our friends, and for any difficult situations which may be lying before us just now. Lord, we lay all of these concerns before you and just take a moment of quietness to present our own personal prayers to you. So Lord, hear our prayers. And we give thanks. We give thanks for those who have gone before us in the faith, those who have been an inspiration to us, those we've loved, those we miss. May they rest in peace and may their memory remain brightly within our hearts. So Lord, hear these our prayers together with the unspoken prayers of every heart for they are presented this day through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And so then to a closing hymn for this morning, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, hymn 457 in the hymn book.
Now let us go forth in peace and in joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day henceforth and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>